In today's gospel, Jesus says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must lead, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. To whom was Jesus referring? Having first gotten permission from the relevant participants, perhaps the following true stories will help. First, was Jesus referring to non-Christians? At a Bible study led by a Christian fundamentalist, the statement was made that if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will go to hell. Surely we have all heard that on occasion. The leader was then asked if that were true, what about the 1.5 billion Muslims? After some squirming in his chair, his response was, well, they are all going to hell. His was the same position our church took during the centuries-old Inquisition and that some current-day non-Christian extremists take when condemning Christians. The lone Catholic in the room said, well, we Catholics believe that we must leave the bigger decisions up to God, and 1.5 billion souls seems to be one of the bigger decisions. Though delivered with some sarcasm, the point was that God does not have an ego requiring credit before he will save us. Put another way, we don't earn our salvation by reciting certain words. God loves unconditionally, and we cannot judge what he will do with any one individual. That is why Blessed Mother Teresa said, if you are going to be a Hindu, be the best Hindu that you can be. Second, was Jesus referring to those who don't believe in God? A parishioner called me and asked for a ministry to her father who was dying of a cancerous brain tumor. He was the top medical doctor in his specialty in the world, both smart and compassionate. She said, but there's one thing, he claims not to believe in God. My response was that we shouldn't force a meeting on him, but she said that her father was meeting out of love for her and his two granddaughters, all of whom had recently converted to Catholicism. Since he was dying at home, the first step was teaching centering, a form of contemplative prayer to his daughter and granddaughters, which seemed to open them to God's peace that they so desperately needed. Upon my entrance to his bedroom alone and desperate for words from the Holy Spirit, after introducing myself, I said I was not there to try to convert him, only to show him and his family love. He immediately responded that he couldn't be converted anyway. The ground rules were clearly set. Well into the conversation, knowing he was meeting out of love for his distraught family, and where there is love, there is God, I suggested that he may want to tell his family that he will see them again after he dies. He immediately and adamantly rejected that idea, since he didn't believe in an afterlife. I quickly apologized, saying I was wrong to make such a suggestion because it would violate his conscience. I didn't share this with his daughter until months later. We ended by teaching him a secular meditative technique similar to centering prayer. About a month later, when he had only a few days to live, his daughter requested a return visit. He was starving himself to death since, as a doctor, he knew the painful consequences of dying from the tumor. Flat on his back, bald, and without strength to sit, the family prayed over him. Then, with a brief reminder of the previous teaching, we entered centering prayer in silence. With a surprised look in his eyes, he clearly recognized that what we had privately practiced during our last visit was actually prayer with faith in God. Since the daughter and granddaughters were young in their faith and still under some previous fundamentalist influence, they were worried about his salvation. He, on the other hand, was concerned about his conscience. My desperate appeal was to the Holy Spirit for words that will simultaneously respect both him and his offspring. I said to him, it doesn't matter what you claim to believe. God loves you and will be there for you anyway. He sat up in bed with an incredulous look on his face, not angry, but surprised. A few days later, his daughter called and said he had passed away. She then said that before he died, he said he looked forward after death to see his previously deceased father and dog. He then had asked to see his sister, from whom he was estranged for 15 years. She was a fundamentalist minister whose denomination believed what the first story described. 
He clearly had long ago rejected that gun to the head threat to his free will. Yet with her at his deathbed, he converted to believe in God in the afterlife. The sheep, of course, represent all men and women, all beings of flesh and spirit that God created in his image and in his likeness. That is why church teaching reiterated at Vatican II is that if you claim to be not Catholic, not Christian, or even not believe in God, you can still go to heaven. The reason is that we never know what God's plans are, as demonstrated in previous, the previous story and referred to by Jesus in today's gospel when he says, They will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Even before Vatican II, the church condemned Jesuit Father Leonard Feeney for denying salvation to non-Catholics. My hour-long private meeting with the Serbic anti-religion atheist Sam Harris was an attempt to set the record straight on his misinterpretations of Catholic teaching on the subject. Though unsuccessful, I ended the discussion with a sincere hug, which clearly disarmed him. All we are being asked to do is to love God and all humans, including non-believers, as Jesus loved us. We are to seek truth, the fullness of truth of which is in Catholic teaching. Jesus' call for unity is now on its way to being realized. The Reformation debate of faith versus good works that led to some of the misconceptions in the previous true stories is now partially resolved in the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification. The Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church signed it in 1998, and the World Methodist Conference joined the agreement in 2006. The Declaration essentially says that true faith leads to good works. Faith cannot be true without also having good works. There has also been agreement between the major Christian denominations on a common liturgical calendar and the same Sunday readings. These were historic steps on the road toward the Christian unity that Jesus called for. But how do we love even though those outside Jesus fold? The challenge is to first intellectually separate outward signs of possible immoral behavior from inward inculpability before God. To not make that distinction is to play God by assuming we can know whether the person has a functioning brain to enable their full freedom and adequate truth to enable their full knowledge. Only God can know that. Blessed Mother Teresa demonstrated this ability when she took from the streets a man covered in maggots. He cursed her while she was cleaning him. When asked by a young nun how she could do that, she said that Jesus was just having a bad day. In other words, she saw the Holy Spirit dwelling within him and not his culpability before God for his actions. So how do we first test and then implement this within our lives? Honestly, how would we react in our minds if, during the prayers of the faithful at this Mass, we were asked to pray not just for victims, but for those who hurt the victims without condoning their evil actions. Are we prepared to love and, if necessary, defend Catholic teaching? If we can't trust someone and justifiably take steps to protect ourselves, can we still love them knowing that trust is not the same as love? Though civil society is obligated to protect itself from criminals, often by incarceration, and we are obligated to objectively make decisions on the morality of behavior, can we refrain from subjectively condemning the person as culpable? If an ex-spouse shows anger, can we refrain from responding in anger and turn it over to God to judge? Christ is the Good Shepherd, and as part of the body of Christ, can we also be Good Shepherds?